Welcome to worship. We are grateful that you are joining us today. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this Lenten journey. We ask you as we go through these days and our countdown towards Easter that you would draw us closer to you and closer to one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The good news comes to us from the seventh chapter of John's Gospel. Then the temple police went back to the chief priests and Pharisees, who asked them, Why did you not arrest Jesus? The police answered, Never has anyone spoken like this. Then the Pharisees replied, Surely you have not been deceived also, have you? Has any one of the authorities or of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which does not know the law, they are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was not and who was one of them asked our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing does it they replied to nicodemus surely you are not also from galilee are you search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from galilee this is the word of the lord thanks be to god so there was this guy uh going around Jerusalem, going around Israel, especially in John chapter 7, going around this festival, this religious festival called the Festival of the Tabernacles. There's this guy, his name is Jesus, and he was making some spectacular claims about himself, and his followers and the people who were excited about him were also making these really remarkable claims about who he is and what he was up to. I mean, they were saying he's the Messiah. They were saying that he is a, the Son of God. They were saying that he's the savior of the world. I mean, <laughs> really big claims. And so in this festival, in John chapter 7, this, this religious ceremony, this festival, everybody was buzzing about Jesus. Everyone was talking about him. Where They're trying to figure out, is he for real or not? Is he really what he says he is? Is, is Jesus truly, you know, the Messiah, the savior of the people? Or is he just some charismatic madman or charismatic con man. The religious authorities, the Pharisees especially, they had their answer. They had their answer pretty much immediately. They knew that Jesus was not the guy. He was just either a madman or he was a liar. One of those two things. They didn't know which, but they knew he was not the Messiah. Their big reason why was because he's from Galilee. 
I mean, that's their smoking gun. Because no prophet's going to come out of Galilee. They knew that. They knew that much. And to be honest, it's not that crazy of an argument. It is absurd for a prophet to say they're coming out of Galilee. It's a little bit like saying the Messiah is going to come out of Iowa. Nothing against Iowa. Iowa is fine. But it isn't exactly, forgive me people from Iowa, but it isn't exactly the center of the universe. You know, it's not Rome. It's not Jerusalem. You would not expect the Messiah to come from Ames in the same way you'd expect the Messiah to come from Bethlehem. Or even, I don't know, any, any population center, New York City, Beijing. That makes more sense than Des Moines. And so it's the same kind of thing. They're saying the Messiah is coming from Galilee? No, it makes sense for the Pharisees to shake their heads at that. But the thing about the Pharisees and a lot of the rest of the people at that festival is that they never really met Jesus. Most of them didn't. I mean, Nicodemus did, and, and he was kind of arguing on, on Jesus' side. But most of them had no idea what Jesus looked like even. They didn't know, they didn't, hadn't heard Jesus' voice. They hadn't had an encounter with Jesus. The people who did, the people who saw Jesus, listened to Jesus, had a conversation with Jesus, it didn't matter where he came from. There was something different about him, something transformative, something beautiful, something bigger than, than the people around them, something remarkably different. But still then begs the question to us 2,000 years later, how do we know? A lot of time has passed. How do we decide? How do we know if what Jesus is saying about himself is true or not? What the church says about Jesus, how do we know if it's true or not? How do, we, how do we make that decision? How do we figure that out? It's, it's such a big thing, and the world is so confusing right now. I think right now, honestly, I think right now it is harder to figure out what is true than any other time in human history. It is just confusing out there. Uh, truth and falsehood, reality and fake, it's all so muddled together right now. I'm going to tell you guys something, a story, a real thing a real thing that has happened in the last few years, and I'm pretty sure that the more I tell you about it, the more confused you are going to be. Um, and that's kind of the point. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to do my best to be clear about it, but even as clear as I can possibly be, there's something at the heart of this story that is just muddled and confusing. So in 2017, a guy went to a protest or like a counter protest or it was like a protest, a protest, counter protest. I don't even understand what the protest was about, but he went to the protest and he had a sign and it was a big sign and the sign said, birds aren't real. That's what the sign said. And somebody came up to him at some point during this, this protest or counter protest, whatever it was, and they asked him, tell me about your sign. And the guy said very earnestly, very sincerely, without, you know, winking or grinning, he said, well, 50 years ago, all the birds went extinct, and the government, to, to, to mask that occurrence, plus, uh, in order to spy on the population, they created all these little drones that now go around and record you. And those, all the birds you see are robots, and they're not real. That's what he said. And people heard this. And a lot of people, especially of a certain generation, Generation Z, I think, that age, really glommed onto this. Now, 98% of the people are kidding. They think it's funny. The guy himself who is saying this, he was just making it up as he went. He just thought it was funny. He was making fun of conspiracy theories and making fun of people who believe in this kind of stuff. And a lot of the people who, you know, glommed onto it believed the same thing. It was just a joke. They were just being sat satire. It was just... It, but then the media kind of took a hold of this as well and would tell stories. It was in the New York Times. The New York Times ran a story about birds aren't real. And the New York Times also said, this is a joke. They're just being funny. But there's also this other layer where not everybody got the joke. And so some people believe that there is a group of young people out there that believe that birds aren't real. There's people who think that. And then there's other people who don't get the joke and actually kind of bought into the conspiracy a little bit. They, they probably have some mental health issues, but they bought into the conspiracy and they actually, they actually believe that birds aren't real. So what I struggle with this story is all of the layers of reality 
and fake and joking and sincerity and truth and fiction and satire and trying to figure out what is really real and what isn't in this story. It's, it, when I was about 10 years old, uh, we went on this field trip to uh, the capital of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, I remember walking in to the Capitol building and right into the very center, there's this dome and you can look all the way up and it's, I don't know how many stories, like four or five stories up, but there's something about standing there and looking up at this dome and it was so high up that I had this feeling like I was gonna fall upward into the dome, like I felt dizzy. I had this vertigo feeling looking upwards, like the ground, even though it was like marble, the ground became soft underneath my feet. Things got squishy. <laughs> And that's how I feel about this story, about this just goofy birds aren't real story. It just makes the truth feel squishy. It gives this feeling in my stomach of dizziness, of vertigo, that how do we know what is anything true? Is anything sincere? How do we know what is real and what isn't? Again, it's that same question that we've been asking for 2,000 years. How do we know what's real when it comes to Jesus? We live in a time when it's so hard to figure out anything that's true, anything that's real. How do we know what's real about one of the most important things in the universe? How do we know what's real about Jesus? Well, for me, when I have these feelings, when I, when I feel like the world is getting a little bit too gray and fuzzy, a lot of times what I just need to do is you know, shut off the computer, turn off the internet, and just focus on what I can see and smell and hear and taste. What is concrete that is around me that I can say, okay, this mug is real. This pew that I'm sitting on is real because I can encounter it and touch it. And I think for me, that it's the same thing with Jesus. And it to be true, in John chapter 7, it's the same thing with Jesus for the people who encountered him there too. I mean, the Pharisees from far off, they did not believe that Jesus was real, but the people who actually encountered him did. And I think the same is true for me today. I believe in Jesus. I believe that the claims that Jesus made about himself and that the church makes about Jesus, I believe that they are true because I have had an encounter with the Christ because I've seen Jesus, I've heard his voice, I've experienced Jesus in a very real concrete way. When I was 20 years old, I met Jesus and Jesus turned my life absolutely upside down and turned me inside out and made me something new. And since that, I mean, it's not all the time. I'm there certainly, I go through these periods of deserts, periods of darkness, periods where Jesus feels really far away. But again and again throughout my life, still, Jesus shows up in my life and I see him. I hear his voice. He is as close to me as my next heartbeat. When my mom died, I remember in the hospital room, in that moment when her, when her breathing stopped, I felt Christ as close to me in that moment as my next breath. When I was sick with the chemotherapy and the community just gathered around me and cared for me so well, every single lasagna that was brought to my house, I experienced the presence of Jesus, the hands and feet of Jesus caring for me in my time of need. As I've been able to do service projects, as I've been able to, to go out and serve others, that feeling of community, that feeling of, of being a part of the body of Christ has been absolutely real to me. And every time I come into this space, every Sunday as we gather around this table, right behind the camera, and we eat the bread and we drink the wine, I experience that real presence of Christ in my life. So that's how I know I know because I've seen Jesus, I've heard his voice, I've touched, I've tasted, I've, I've smelled Jesus in the world. But dear friends in Christ, this is the season of Lent. It is a time for reflection. It's time to ask 
the big questions and sit with them. So I don't expect you to, to take my answer as yours. I encourage you to take some time this week, some quiet moment of reflection, to sit and think and pray and ponder that question. How do you know that what Jesus says is real? How do you know that the claims that the church makes about the Christ are true? Take some time this week and answer that question for yourself. Amen. Care Clinic is here to serve um, people who are uninsured or underinsured in our community. We offer free medical care, including free medication. Last year, we secured over a half million dollars worth of medications for patients. We also have mental health services that are bilingual in both English and Spanish. Our dental program is now our largest program of the clinic. Um, our county ranked the third worst of all 87 counties before we expanded our dental programs in providing access to people who are under and uninsured. Um, now we're in the top 50th percentile of um, the, the state um, for providing that dental access and we hope to continue to improve those numbers. We also have social services, including MNsure, that's available to the whole community. So we always try to provide access to health care first by connecting people to affordable insurance. So just know that that service is available to everyone. Um, our mission is to provide access, community access, resources, and education. So that's our name, and that's um, our mission. So thank you for your support. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks. We give us we give you thanks for when we least expect it, you show up. You wrap us in your grace. You remind us that we are yours. 
Help us to be mindful of your presence this day and in all that we say and all that we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we give you thanks for the groups in this world that we get to partner with to do your work. Today we give you thanks for the care clinic right here in Red Wing, uh, for the medical treatment that they provide, for the dentistry treatment that they provide. We give you thanks for their staff, the myriad of volunteers, and of course for the people who, who go there for services. Thank you for this partnership. Help us to continue to be faithful uh, in all that we say and all that we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most merciful God, we pray for those in need this day. We pray for Dick Johnson, Barbara Steffenhagen, Marilyn Thompson, Nancy Holty, Barb Hansen, and Michael Rigone. Surround them with your grace and give them the peace that only you can give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.